Welcome to Worship with Tremont United Methodist Church. My name is Larry. I'm the lead pastor here, and I'm so glad that you've joined us for this online worship service. In these strange and difficult times, we are committed to providing uh, quality worship services that connect you uh, with, with Jesus and deeper relationship with him and connect you to the life of the church, whether that's in person at 8.30 or 11 a.m. on Sunday mornings or at 10 a.m. or 6 p.m. right here online. Uh, we're here for you and we're glad that you are worshiping with us. As we begin this service, I have a couple of things that I'd like to ask you to do. The first is to follow the link that's attached to the video uh, to use our online attendance pad. You register your attendance that way. It lets us know who's worshiping with us. You can also pass along prayer concerns uh, to us that way. If you'd like to give an offering this morning, uh, you can uh, mail a check to the church uh, or you can give online at paypal.me forward slash Tremont UMC. We thank you for your support. Uh, uh, and worshiping God through giving during this time. Uh, also included in the links for the video are uh, uh, our announcements for this week, along with our prayer list and a link to our field guide. And the field guide is a great way for you to follow along during the service. Uh, scripture is included there. There are questions for your small group or your family to go deeper uh, into the into the sermon, uh, as as well as a field guide for daily prayer. Uh, we're we're beginning today week two of this sermon series, How to Pray. Uh, last week, I, I began by preaching about pause and how to pause in God's presence to be still and know that he is God. And Pastor Kathy has a great word for us today about part two of that, rejoice. As we prepare our hearts for worship, would you pray with me? Gracious God, I give you thanks for this day and for these friends who have gathered together for this service. And I pray that you would make their homes right now into sanctuaries that they would be blessed by the visitation of your Holy Spirit, that as we worship together, even though we are uh, separated by technology, may we be joined by that same technology and the power of your Holy Spirit to worship you in spirit and in truth, as you call all of your followers to do. To the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Let's worship together. Come, thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise mine Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come. And I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus, me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Good morning. Our scripture passage this morning is taken from Matthew, uh, chapter 6, verse 9. One scripture. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Today is week two of our sermon series entitled, How to Pray. And if you'll remember, last week, Pastor Larry introduced an acronym, P-R-A-Y. And he shared that the P stood for pause, 
and explain the importance of pausing before we pray to get in that right headspace, so to speak, to pause and allow time for our thoughts to clear, which provides space for the Holy Spirit to speak to us during our prayer. So today we move on to the R in our acronym, and that stands for rejoice. So let's take a, just a word of just time for a word of prayer here before we start. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, I pray that you meet us in this place, whether we're worshiping online or uh, we're, we're worshiping um, in our different houses and our different places and spaces. Lord, I, I pray that you meet us and that you uh, would speak through me and touch uh, your, your followers, your people this day. Lord, equip them uh, to hear your voice when they pause and then rejoice as we continue to learn about this process of prayer. Equip us, Lord, to hear you so we can grow deeper in relationship to you. In Jesus' name, I pray. It's no joke, and I have shared um, with you many times that uh, my happy place, or at least the place where I feel very close to God, is at the beach. I start to to be very anxious about uh, wanting to get to that beach when I'm on the way there. Uh, when I get off the plane and I walk uh, down the little ramp uh, that we have before you get into the airport, I can, I can just taste it. I can feel the breeze. I know that the beach is coming. I can feel the ocean. Um, I just know it's coming and I get very, um, I'm very anxious to get there and, and to see it. I believe that the reason that I feel that way is because when I am next to the ocean, when I'm actually there, I feel no anxiety. I have no worries. Um, it's that constant rhythm of the waves, um, feeling the, the warmth of the sun, feeling the sand between my toes. Um, it, it is where I feel closest to God. I think it's because the ocean is bigger, much bigger than I am or any problem I may have. I can hear the ocean that's a constant reminder that it's bigger than I am or any problem I have. And I can, even if I see a picture of the ocean, nothing beats being in the presence of the ocean. I sense it with every one of my emotions. And last week, Pastor Larry talked about all of us having a thin place. And what he meant by that was a place where we and meet with God, it, it, it's thin, it's between where he's at and where we're at. And for me, the beach is my thin place. I feel close to God. I never want to leave. In fact, if you were to ask Mike, I'm kind of a grouch on the day that we are uh, heading back uh, to Tremont or heading back to wherever we currently living at that time because I don't wanna leave. I wanna stay right there at the beach. You know, I rejoice in who God is, and I am awe of who God is when I'm at the beach. So the R in the P-R-A-Y acronym, it stands for rejoice or adoration. When we go to the Lord in prayer, I wonder if we really understand who God is when we approach him. Do we really understand the vastness of who we're speaking to? So I, I want to ask you this question. We're going to be going back to this question throughout uh, the sermon today. And the question is this. When and where did you last feel close to God? And would our prayer life be enriched if we approached God with the same awe that I feel every time I sense his presence at the ocean? Each one of us has a unique view of the vastness of God. For me, it happens at the ocean or on the beach. But for some, if you were to ask my mother, um, she feels close to God when she's in the midst of the mountains. For some people, it's nature. For some people, they feel the awesomeness or the vastness of God in the eyes of a child or serving the homeless or caring for the sick. We all connect to the vastness of God in different ways. So what is it for you? In his book that Larry was talking about last week, Pete Gregg um, wrote a book called How to Pray. 
And he states this following. Here's a quote from that book. You are a new song that God has given to the world, a song that no one else can sing. The way you think, the way you see life, the way you worship, everything is utterly unique. So Pete Gregg is saying that each of us rejoice in God's presence differently. So I'll ask you again, when and where did you last feel close to God? If you can just harness that feeling, then you will understand the R in our acronym. Now, why is all this important? Most of us approach uh, God with a laundry list of needs when we pray, right? And sometimes we even keep a list of them so we don't forget anything. And at times we are so obsessed and so focused on our need that we can't think of anything else. We have this laundry list. We need to pray. And we may take time to thank God for our blessings, but these words of gratitude, they're intermingled with that list of needs. Many of us have prayed for years for the same thing, and, and we're still waiting for answers. We're weary. We're tired. And prayer can become a time of just rushing right next into the next letter of our acronym, which is A, ask. For some of us, our entire prayer life is all evolved around the ask part of the acronym. But I want to challenge you with, uh, with something this morning. What if we began our prayer time by intentionally praying like Jesus taught his disciples to pray? It's our one and only scripture this morning. One line, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. The invitation to rejoice or adore means great greeting our Heavenly Father by name, meeting His smile with ours, receiving Him as the loved one He truly is, and responding to His kindness with our adoration, His presence with our presence. It's a way of connecting to His vastness. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Addressing God as Father, it reflects Jesus' own intimate relationship with God and the fact that he instructs his disciples and all of those who followed him to address God the same way means that we can have a similar, similar relationship with God as Jesus had. When we pray that God's name be hallowed or sanctified, is to pray that God's people will bring honor to his name by living holy lives. So let's take it a, just a step deep, deeper. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be thy name. It's a request, really. It's not a declaration as we would think. We're not saying, Lord, your name is hallowed. We are requesting, Lord, cause your name to be hallowed. That is, cause your name to be believed, cause your displeasure to be feared, cause your commandments to be obeyed, and cause yourself to be glorified. You see, you hallow the name of God when you trust him, when you revere him, when you obey him, and when you glorify him. Hallowed be your name. When we begin our prayers with rejoicing in the hallowedness or the vastness of God, we begin to sense his presence with us. And pretty soon the vastness is in harmony with the intimacy of the prayer. And when those two meet, that is when we can begin then to understand how great God is compared to how small we are. Psalm 8 describes this intersection, this harmony between vastness and intimacy. Let's listen to Psalm 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You've set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. 
When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you're mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and you crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hand. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You see, the R in our acronym, to rejoice in God at the beginning of our prayer time is acknowledging the God of the psalm, the psalmist just describes in Psalm 8. It's acknowledging his vastness, at the same time enjoying intimacy with this big, wonderful, great God. So what's it look like? What, what does a prayer, what is a rejoicing prayer, what does that even look like? Well, we find an example of it in the fourth chapter of Acts. And so before we jump into the prayer, I need to give you a little context of the prayer. Um, as you will remember, in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit appeared to many that were gathered that day. The Spirit appeared as blowing of a violent wind and tongues of fire rested on the heads of the believers. But Peter addresses the crowd gathered there with announcement. And he said, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, the next day, Peter decided he was going to heal a crippled beggar at the temple gate. And this really upset the authorities of the day. They were called the Sanhedrin. Peter and John were put into jail because of this healing. And when questioned the next day by the authorities how it was even possible to heal this crippled man, Peter explained the healing with this statement. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. We read on to the, with the context of the story in Acts chapter 4, 13 through 22. Here's the story. When the authorities saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that these, these two men, they were unschooled, they were ordinary, they were, they were all astonished. And they took note that these men were doing this act of healing in the name of Jesus. But since they could see that the man who'd been healed standing there uh, was with them, there was nothing they could say about it because the evidence was there. The man was healed. So... They ordered Peter and John to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and they all kind of conferred together and they asked themselves this, what are we going to do with these two? Everybody living in Jerusalem knows that they've done this outstanding miracle and we certainly can't deny it, but we got to stop this thing from spreading any further. So we must tell them never to speak again of the name of Jesus. So they called Peter and John together and they commanded them to not, do not speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we simply cannot stop speaking about what we've seen and heard. So the Sanhedrin couldn't decide how to punish him because all of the people were praising God for what had happened. On their release, because they couldn't do anything else with them, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had sent to them. And when they had heard this, all the people raised their voices and they prayed this prayer. So all that was the context up to this rejoicing prayer. Listen closely. Sovereign Lord, you've made the heaven and the earth and the seas and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David, saying, Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, 
Consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after they prayed that prayer of praise, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God boldly. Now, there were 137 words in that prayer, but only the last 35 were actually requests. The rest of the words were rejoicing and adoration for what God had done for them in the past. Sometimes an adoration prayer takes on the shape of a song. There's a prayer in the Gospel of Luke that is an example of a prayer filled with adoration, and it is sung many times by many choirs across the world, usually during Advent, and it's known as Mary's Magnificat. Now, the context of this prayer is found in Luke 1, 26 through 38. We hear this in Advent, but I don't know that you understood the context of it. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin, pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus. He'll be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she, who was said to be barren, is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. And here was Mary's response. I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. And then the angel left her. Now, I'm pretty sure that if this whole event, if this would have happened to me, the last thing I would want to do at that point is burst out in song with a prayer of adoration. But this is Mary's response to the angel's um, message. Here's what she says. My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will, be, will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He's scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He's brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He's filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. Mary was told by an angel that she was to give birth to the Savior of the world. But Mary was young, and she was not married, and she knew she'd be publicly humiliated. Her prayer could have been a long list of requests and possibly protests. But instead, Mary's prayer was a prayer of adoration to the mighty acts of God. Several years ago, I was standing in the line at Kroger after getting groceries, and I was about four people back. And I noticed this little book uh, sitting on the rack. I don't know if you can see it. Hopefully you can see that, this little book. 
The book is uh, God Whispers in the Night by Marie uh, Shropshire. Now, this little book cost me $5, okay, at the time. And the title just caught my eye, God Whispers in the Night. Inside the little book is about 200, there's only 200 pages, but there's 50 meditations inside each book. And they're all grouped in categories. Some of the categories are unstable emotions, time pressure, loneliness, feelings of despair, loss of a loved one, and each category is written as if God is speaking directly to you if you find yourself in one of these categories of emotions. So to end uh, my time with you this morning, I'm going to share with you the category in this little book entitled Questions About Prayer. And this is what God is saying to all of us as we approach him in this in this uh, season of, of prayer, in this time of prayer, as we try to wrestle with pause and now um, to reflect on an adoration and rejoice. So here's what God is saying to you. Dear child of mine, prayer is not an obligation to fulfill, but an opportunity to enjoy fellowship with me. It's opening yourself to receive the gift of myself. I love you and I'm not a task maker. Realize that it is I who takes the initiative. Your prayer is your response to me. Your inspiration to pray may come through reading the scriptures or through your thoughts and feelings. Do you not find when you are dissatisfied with your prayer life, it is a time when you are not sufficiently aware of my loving presence or at a time when you're feeling unworthy Remember, my child, that you are worthy through Christ and reject false feelings of guilt. Realize that your union with me does not depend on your love, but upon my love. Cultivate a consciousness of your union with me. I'm always near, even within you. You cannot enjoy communing with me if you perceive me as a far off judgmental God. I am always present. You do not have to do anything to earn my presence. Prayer is giving yourself to me. Forget what you've heard regarding rule keeping. Prayer is not is prayer is to be enjoyed, not endured. Let your primary purpose in prayer be to worship me, to rejoice in me, and to enjoy my presence. Never measure the success of your prayer life by anyone else's experience. You are growing into the person I created you to be. Accept yourself and your prayer life without trying to do what is unnatural for you. You'll find your own methods of prayer changing from time to time, varying from day to day, and that is natural. I am the Lord, your God, who teaches you what is best for you, who directs you in the way you should go. And this includes your prayer life. My dear child, rest in that assurance. So I leave you with this question. When and where did you last feel close to God? When and where did you begin your prayer by our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name? Take some time. Pause to clear your thoughts and rejoice in the vastness of our great God. Do it today because he's waiting for you with arms wide open, waiting to have a conversation. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Lord, we don't have to say that just at the beginning of the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray. We can say that at the beginning of every prayer that we will ever pray to you. And, and God, as we, as we do that, we are asking you 
to reveal your vastness to us. We are asking you, Lord, to uh, make sure that we understand how good and great you really are compared to who we are. We are asking you to show your greatness and your goodness compared to the problems on our list, that you are greater than any, any problem that we have on our list of things that, that we need to ask. Help us to take time to bask in that vastness. I, I think of the way, Lord, in which I, I feel you and I sense you when I go to the beach. There isn't anything uh, that I have to do. I, I'm just there. And that same kind of feeling, Lord, is what we need to do when we come to you in prayer. To just sit and allow you to be God. And so I pray for that this morning, that all of, the, all of your children, all of the listeners that are, are tuned in right now can, can take some time and enjoy your presence as we continue to pray the, the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed through many dangers, toils, and snares. I have already come. This grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will. Shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we'd first begun. As you go about your day, take some time and just allow yourself some space. Pause first. Allow your head to be clear. Allow your mind to uh, be focused. And then just bask in the vastness of God. Looking back on, on, the, on the two examples that we gave um, of people in the Bible who were against just un unsurmountable odds and, and situations, and yet they found within themselves that they found within themselves the way to rejoice in who God is. Do that today. Allow yourself to understand the vastness of God and allow him to be with you. Allow his presence to warm you. And um, as, as you go about your business today, Lord will put uh, people in your path. Because when you leave, whatever you're doing right now, if you're online or, or whatever the case may be, when you leave, you're going into the mission field. 
where people will need a kind, caring, and supporting word. God is sending you out to get the word out, to go in the knowledge and assurance of God's love for you and Jesus, and who will empower you to be his witnesses through the power of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Amen.